Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child using the method of catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. Welcome back to the podcast this week. I am excited that each and every one of you is with us. Today, we have Anna Hurdle on the podcast to dive into chapter three. Anna is a Montessorian who has been working with this second plain child, this elementary age child. And so she is going to be able to speak into who this elementary age child is, which is what chapter three of Life in the Vine, The Joyful Journey is all about. If you haven't gotten your hands on a copy yet, I'll have a link to how you can purchase it in the show notes. So get some of your friends together or fellow catechists or other parents that you would like to read this book with. These two podcast episodes, this one and the one that we just did two weeks ago, are kind of companions to the book to help you digest and further think a little bit more into it. We have a model of a book study that you can use on our website if you would like to dive into this book with a friend. Again, I will put a link to the book study in our show notes. I hope you enjoy. Anna Hurdle, I am so excited to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you, Carrie. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I have been hoping to have you on the podcast for a long time. So I'm really excited that we finally are able to join up and make it happen. It's quite mutual. Anna, would you tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got involved in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd? Okay, I'll do that. Um, (laughs) I found, I discovered um, Catechesis of the Good Shepherd uh, through um, sending my children to Montessori school when they were very young. I met a woman named Holly Tosco, and she is is still a friend and was an early collaborator with me in Montessori and as well as Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. So that was in the early 90s. I decided to, to become a Montessori guide and a catechist. Simultaneously, I took my mm-hmm. formation courses at the same time in different locales, but at the same time. I discovered Montessori, oddly enough, through a, um, an experience I had with our older son when he was in uh, Mother's Morning Out as a toddler. And I thought I had done all of the homework. I thought I had checked out the safety, the cleanliness, and checked all the boxes for this particular facility. But then upon his participation in this, uh, with this Mother's Morning Out group, I realized that there was more to child development than those boxes I had checked. And so that led me to explore. It's a very short story of a rather long one, <laughs> but um, <laughs> that is, is how I decided to explore other options that landed me with Montessori, which ended up being a life-changing decision on so many different levels. And now you are a Montessori guide for lower elementary or upper elementary? Um, for lower elementary, I, I'm uh, 6 to 12, uh, so I could do either. But I have always pretty much stayed with the 6 to 9-year-olds in my uh, Montessori class. And in my atrium, I primarily work with the 9 to 12-year-olds. So I'm mm-hmm. pretty immersed with the second plane child. Mm-hmm. And you're a formation leader as well? Yes, yes. Yes, I was very blessed to have you as my formation leader for one of my level yes. two formations. And I'm, I remember having a lot of very profound moments in that formation. It, for, for me as well. Yeah. So I am really excited about this episode, not only for you to be on the podcast, but especially because of our topic I think just because of the nature of our work, we tend to talk about that level one, that that first plain child a lot. And it, and it makes sense. I mean, it's the foundation of our work. But that level two and three, that second plain child, sometimes can seem like a mystery. 
especially if we're really immersed in that level one child. So I'm really excited for this topic as we dive into this chapter three of Life in the Vine, a Joyful Journey Continues, that really dives into the elementary age child. But Anna, you have a quote that you would like to share as we get started. Is that correct? I do. Um, I realize that this podcast will not air for probably a month, but as Carrie and I are recording today, it is uh, June 4th, and this is the day, I'm of the Episcopal tradition, Mm -hmm. and this is the day that the Episcopal Church commemorates Pope John Paul XXIII, and so I wanted to share this quote It is possible to see a clear analogy between the mission of the shepherd in the church and that of the prudent and generous educator in the Montessori method, who with tenderness, with love, and with a wise evaluation of gifts, knows how to discover and bring to light the most hidden virtues and capacities of the child. Mm. It is really amazing that a Pope is making these connections with Montessori in this way, especially the wisdom that this method brings to those hidden virtues and capacities of the child. That's really, that's really beautiful. And that analogy between the mission of the shepherd in the church. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and that of Dr. Montessori. Yeah. I also would just like to um, say what a gift this entire book is, Life in the Vine, to our entire catechesis community, not just Catechesis USA, but all over the world, mm-hmm. in that Rebecca has been able to, to get these words to paper and to um, have these preserved for us. It is very true. Just like the first joyful journey that allows this work, especially for parents to be much more accessible. I know that Sophia's words in Religious Potential of the Child, both one and two, they're, they they sometimes can be really hard to digest, especially if you're not really immersed in the work. But Rebecca's work with Life in the Vine, and even in the first joyful journey, it makes this work so much more digestible and accessible for those beginners, especially for parents. Yes, I think um, the parent, this is a true gift for parents as well. Yeah. I also find it, I find it such a beautiful refresher Mm -hmm. of all the different things that we've touched on in formation to revisit it. And that's one of those things that I really like about doing the podcast is because it allows me to isolate one piece of my formation and and dive into it really deep with someone who knows it a lot more than me, like like the elementary age child and sitting with you. And so just teach me again, Anna, and teach me all about the elementary age child. Well, it's <laughs> such a great age, isn't it? It is. It really is. I think level two is my favorite. Uh-huh. Level one is so beautiful and intentional, but there's something about that level two child that it just... It just really resonates with me very well. Well, Anna, I was thinking that we could start off with revisiting the planes of development. And what are they? The planes of development. Well, as you know, Montessori wasn't the only person to suggest that humans develop in successive stages, planes, as she called Mm -hmm. them, Um, other um, psychologists and educators have have had similar theories, but they were always isolated to one type of development, like Piaget with cognitive development, um, perhaps Kohlberg with moral development, mm-hmm. and so forth. Whereas Montessori looked at the whole child, at the spiritual, at the physical, at, with the cognitive, um, social development. Not only the whole child in looking at all of those areas, but the whole child from before birth all the way through adulthood. Mm -hmm. So recalling it goes all the way from uh, pre-birth all the way to age um, 24. Um, And so um, 
looking at these stages, uh, of course, she called them constructive triangles because the child or the person was always becoming, was always moving away from something and moving to something else. So that was, mm -hmm. it's always a, this dynamic um, action or rhythm that is occurring. If we look more carefully at the second plane, there's just, just such a really good overview of that child in chapter three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Looking at the physical, the emotional, the social, the intellectual, and the moral development. And like you said, it's right in one place. It's, it's a nice synopsis of who that child is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I was reading over the descriptions of that second plane child, it reminded me of our formation mm -hmm. in level two, where we compare that level one child with the second plane child and comparing their physical differences, like they're bigger, their hands are bigger. Right. So, you know, we need bigger chairs and et cetera. But then the intellectual differences, you know, like they can move in time and space and about moral and how they care about right and wrong and how social and how they they want to do everything in groups. But that level one child is so, so content to do everything by themselves. But right. the level two and level three child, they want to partner up and do everything in groups because right, right. they're so social. One thing that Rebecca said in the book that I hadn't thought of before was how this age child moves from caring about being with the adult to move to wanting to be social with their peers. And it made me think about my own children and how my younger children, they, you know, they just want to cuddle up with me and they're very intentional about wanting to have that relationship with me. But my older children who are in their second plane, they want to go hang out with each other or they want to go find someone their own age to hang out with more than cuddle up with me. <laughs> right. For parents, that can sometimes be hurtful. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, but it's actually quite normal. Mm -hmm. And I think an understanding of that, the, the differences between each plane helps us to, the difference between what's normal and what's alarming, I guess. These planes help us to understand that a lot more. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important, Carrie, to remember that these are, um, these characteristics are general characteristics that have been based on observation, first beginning with Montessori and then continuing throughout that community as well as the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd community as well, that we do see these unique characteristics, mm -hmm. but every child doesn't arrive at the exact same point with the exact same way. Yeah. So just as children don't grow in a uniform way or rate, they, we can say that they do not cross the threshold of the second plane on the sixth birthday. Right. So it's not like, you know, six, I'm in the second plane here. Mm -hmm. It's always that um, dynamic movement that I've talked about um, a little bit earlier. Mm hmm if you look at the constructive triangles of the planes of development, that uh, vertex that's always half, you know, so mm -hmm. for the six to 12, it would be the nine year old, that nine year old vertex. When mm -hmm. you look at that nine year old child, you, child, usually that vertex is the epitome of what of those descriptors we have used to describe the second plane child. So the first six to nine, they're moving toward it. And then nine to 12, they're moving away from it. Because these younger children, so like the six, seven, eight-year-old child, they might not have embodied all these characteristics that Rebecca's talking about. Right. But they are transitioning to it. They're transitioning, yes. And each child is different. You know, I think in Good Shepherd, we can see that when we have this child who's moved up to first grade. So we've moved him into level two, because that's what you do. But you can see that not every six-year-old, not every first grader 
is necessarily ready for level two, or especially at the very beginning of the year, because the, the transition and the timing is different. They might still be fine in level one, and halfway through the year, they're ready to move up, especially on a social level. Right. That's a really hard and delicate to do, especially with parents in a church setting. Mm-hmm. Well, and you mentioned as a parent how you have felt that that pulling away a little bit from the, mm-hmm. the that cuddling bond to mm-hmm. wanting to be with peers. This transition can be difficult for parents as well as catechists, and it can even be difficult for the children themselves because they're seeking ways to explore their emerging personalities. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, they like to retreat to what is known and what is yeah. comfortable for confidence and security. Yeah, especially in those times, you know, mental or emotional stress. Mm-hmm. And the challenge for us, and again, for the children as well, is that we never know who's going to show up. Right. Is it going to be the child that is, has, is, is moving in, in level two, who's kind of moving into that, or even at the end of level one, showing those signs of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm turning into this, you know, what Montessori called a new child. Uh, but we also see it in our level three atrium as those children start to transition into adolescence. Mm-hmm. And, you know, all of a sudden, there, there just seems to be a different way of interacting with the peers and with the children and the adults. And it's not bad. It's just different. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes we can perceive those younger children who are moving into the second plane as challenging So sometimes we have the child transitioning into level two that might be perceived as challenging Mm -hmm. or even difficult. The child who now is not, has seemingly lost his or her sense of order, is not as precise with grace and courtesy and so forth. But the same thing can happen to the child who's transitioning into, say, the level two atrium, who is still displaying more first plane tendencies. Mm -hmm. And that, that can sometimes cause nervousness or anxiety. So it's just good to be aware of these transitions. I think it's also important to say that transition is not a sign of achievement. Mm. It is a natural progression that happens at different ages for different children. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean necessarily that, you know, two children the same age, one has, has, is displaying more level two characteristics or second plane characteristics than, than another child. It's just a natural progression. Mm -hmm. And would you say also that it might be a personality difference? It possibly could. What about with all these different categories of traits of the level two child that Rebecca lifts up? You know, she talks about the physical, the emotional, the social, the intellectual, the moral. In your experience, does the child tend to move in all five categories, do they tend to transition all, uh, at about the same time with all five of them? Or do children tend to transition in the, each category separately? Does that make sense what I'm asking? I think I understand what you're asking and that they are certainly uh, doing them at different times and at different rates. So mm-hmm. say for instance, in my six to nine classroom, When the first years come in, some of them have not lost a single baby tooth, Mm -hmm. and others have already lost eight. You know, they're Mm -hmm. all four top and bottom front teeth. They've already lost those teeth with permanent teeth. So that's, that's a very clear example there of how children the exact same age can be on different physical timetables. Mm-hmm. Um, 
There are some methods of um, education that correlate the loss of teeth to academic readiness. Um, right. We're not one, but there, that does exist. Sometimes the physical characteristics other than the teeth are another, just a real easy one to pick up on because they're visual. Mm. So the, even the, the looks are, are different. The, the hair has thinned out, the baby fat is gone, and the kind of the cuteness can go away for a little while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she also talks about like the stamina, mm-hmm. a gener- general higher energy. Mm-hmm. Yes. What is a little bit um, probably harder to discern at first um, is that moral development, how that is changing, because it do- it's not always immediate. That takes a little more relationship to be built with those youngest children and to, to be able to see how that development is going along. Cognitive development as well, their intellectual development. We see that that absorbent mind being replaced with the reasoning mind. That uh-huh. is a lot of that comes out in our uh, our presentations, uh, particularly with in in the classroom with the great lessons. Um, just seeing the the look on the children's faces and and their excitability and and love of work. You know, it's a different type of work. Mm -hmm. We see that in the atrium, how children, children who have responded to a parable that they've had in the three to six atrium, such as the Pearl of Great Price, how they begin to to see it so differently and hear Mm -hmm. it so differently in level two. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, you see some children and they are still getting it on a very concrete uh, level mm-hmm. and and really pulling out the beauty of the parable. Once again, I'm thinking of the Pearl of Great Price, much like a three to six year old first plane child would. Mm-hmm. Where like a level one child, the first plane child sees the beauty, the joy of the pearl, Mm -hmm. but a level two child might see like the sacrifice of the merchant. So, and Carrie, I'm recalling a story that has to do with your oldest daughter. The parable was the, uh, the Pharisee and the tax collector. I was giving a course at your parish, St. Peter's, and uh-huh. your daughter had moved out of level two, and I think she was in the nine to twelve, the level three atrium. Is that right? Yeah, sounds about right. Okay, and so um, you asked me to give her that presentation because you said that she always exalted the the Pharisee. Yeah, she always felt like the Pharisee that that was the person the the parable was lifting up as a. Um, but that was the point. But she was a little bit older, so I, I gave her the presentation, and she did the same thing. She had this very beautiful response about the Pharisee following the rules, the Pharisee um, doing as he was told to do. The Pharisee was just living a good life, doing everything correctly. And so, so there. <laughs> but there again, this is a an illustration of a child who was still in that very sensitive period for uh, justice mm. and morality, right and wrong. It's just a very good example of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was probably about 10, maybe 11, because she's 16 now, mm-hmm. so... Mm -hmm. Maybe she's about 10 at that time. So definitely in that second half of that second plane, and at least in the moral classification, she was still in the lower section of the second plane. Right, right. And, and, And clearly in other areas of development, 
she was at different places as well. Yeah, I remember that. I remember her having that response. And I didn't really know what to do. I knew to let it be, but I didn't know if maybe it was the way I was presenting it. Yeah. <laughs> Or if it just, or if it was just where she was. <laughs> no, <laughs> let's try somebody else. <laughs> no, it's in, it, it was exactly where she was, and that she was responding with her level two or with her plain second plane sensibilities. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, Anna, you and I have spoken about who is the second plane child. But could you speak into what face of God this second plane child is looking for compared to the level one child who's like needs the good shepherd, the provider, the protector? But what about that second plane child? What face of God do they need? Well, I think that that is the question that we hold in our minds as we are working with the child. So rather than saying what child of what face of God does this child need to see? And answering it, I'm holding that as my question, as my prayer. Mm. Tell me, what face of God does this child need to see today? So is it, is it God the provider? Is it God mm -hmm. of mercy? Is it God of love? Is it all of the above? But it really could change from day to day. So just yeah. as we are um, exploring that twofold mystery, the mystery of God and the mystery of the child, we want to hold these mysteries very loosely and allow space for that, for that to happen and for it to be revealed to us. Mm. That's such a beautiful but also really... <laughs> Should I say aggravating response? <laughs> <laughs> because it means that it's a constant discernment. Yes. So it means that, especially for this second plane child, where there's such diversity and where the children are, right. and as they get older, it just gets more and more diverse. Right. It means that we have to constantly discern where this child is and maybe even where we are and where our own heart is every single day to discern the answer to that question. What face of God does this person need right, right. now? Is it a mother figure? Is it a father figure? Is it a brother figure? I mean, the list goes on and on. But to know that there's not a definite answer can be very aggravating. Right. But I think if we figure out how to embrace it, it allows us to be so much more docile to the Holy Spirit and to trust the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And again, being so much more respectful of the person that is right in front of us, whoever that is in that moment, you know, it, whether it's the children in the atrium or the children in our life or maybe our spouses or friends or other adults in our life, who is it? Like, who, what face of God do they need in that moment? Right. It's a very profound answer. Right. But it's also really complicated. Well, I think another way to look at it as well, if you think about the progression of presentations from um, level one all the way up to level three, think about how many presentations we have and the vast array of materials we have in the level three atrium. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, a child could easily go through level one, three years of level one catechesis and work, get, get presentations, work with the materials, repeat the work, really integrate that, um, those presentations into their their whole selves. But, you know, once they get to level three, I remember coming to this realization, there's no way they can do all this work. Yeah. And so even our material and even our, our presentation list tell us that. It echoes mm. that. This child cannot do it all, but it needs to be available. It needs to be at their available to them uh, for them to choose or for them to work with. And so, again, we have to ask ourselves, 
What gift does this child need today? What face of God does this child need to see? Mm -hmm. I've never thought of it that way. You know, I've always imagined, you know, like level three, you know, it's, we should stay in there for nine years. Uh-huh. And maybe then we would have exhausted all the presentations. But what you're saying yes. is that we're not supposed to exhaust all the presentations because the children have different needs and the, each of the presentations meet different needs. And so one child might not ever have a need for a specific presentation. And it's always a choice between good and good mm. you know, or wonderful and wonderful. There's, there's never any bad choices. <laughs> That's a good way to look at it. That takes a lot of pressure off, at least. Mm-hmm. Well, what about the environment in the adult of the second plane child? What is different? Well, we've talked a little, we've talked quite a bit, and this chapter does such a, a nice job of, of talking about the, the second plane child. But we also need to look at the adult and the environment for that child. And so when we say that the adult is the dynamic link between the child and the environment, Mm -hmm. what does that mean for us? How do we become, sometimes the word matchmaker is used as well. I like dynamic link, but that is, you know, part of our work to link the child to the environment, to link the child to the material, to the presentations, to each other even. Mm -hmm. And always, always remembering that their work is their prayer. So we've said the child has changed. And again, Montessori even called the second plane child a new child. Mm -hmm. But does the adult need to change? Does the environment need to change? And the answer is yes, it does. Carrie, when you first took level one, did you fall in love with all the precise movements and beautiful ordered materials and all that really beautiful three to six (laughs) way of being? I don't know. I don't think for me... uh, For me, I was... I I thought it was so beautiful, but... (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. I am not a level one child, so it did not resonate with me. Uh So I guess that was what was different when I went to level two. I think that that... Maybe it was the lack it of It was order. more like, this is my, <laughs> yeah. my natural proclivity yeah. is more toward this second plane I child. I think that that was it. I could see the beauty of level one, but that wasn't my internal self, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. It does. And level two, level three child with its complexity and its lack of as much order. Oh, there's still order. It's just a yeah. different kind of order. So that's yes. me. I yes. have order. I just, it's not that same yes. kind of order. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes what happens for some folks is they really are um, connected with this uh, way of being in the level one atrium and the, and the mm-hmm. atrium environment. And it is pleasing it's when you walk into a... a um, well-organized environment. It's like you can just feel your whole body, you know, just relaxing and and that sort of thing. Um, Sometimes when some folks move and start working in level two or level three atrium, they're still operating from a level one understanding of the child. Mm, Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Wanting to carry over those characteristics from the level one atrium into that second plane, that level two and level three atrium. Right. And in my um, uh, secular Montessori classroom, I've even had parents at times comment on, well, why don't you do this anymore? That's something they had done in, in primary. Uh, their primary classroom. Or why do they not have the beautiful practical life exercises anymore it's like because they do real work now yeah they do real practical life they know how to do it they don't have to have discrete exercises to learn the steps and and so forth and of course that's just a simple answer that's much much bigger but 
And I think, though, that's one piece that we need to do a better job in our formation courses of getting people to see that the adult changes to meet the needs of the uh, elementary age child and the environment changes as well. So what are some of those ways that the adult and the environment change? Well, one thing that comes to mind with the adult in our Lava One atrium, do you remember how we've always said to um, measure our words, mm-hmm. to um, count our words and to make our words count, mm-hmm. um, and that we draw the children in to, our, to the work itself? We draw their attention in through our very precise movement and language, Mm -hmm. Um, never speaking and moving at the same time, that just that slow and methodical, intentional way of being. The children of the first plane are, you know, they're, they're absorbing, they're working with that absorbent mind learning through their senses. So we're isolating the senses. So not speaking and moving at the same time. So they can isolate one sense, Mm -hmm. that isolation of difficulty. Well, if we started talking that way and being that way with elementary age children, they would probably walk away. Mm -hmm. That it's just it's it's no longer the way that they are operating or receiving information. So one way that we can draw in the elementary age child is through our words. Mm-hmm. And, but instead of, we, we, you know, we still want to be careful with our words, but now we have more information to give mm-hmm. or we have more story to tell. And children can take being talked to and being shown something at the same time. Mm -hmm. We no longer have to break that down. We're also um, trying to appeal to the child's sense of imagination and intellect, an intellect that's guided by the imagination. And so these great stories are very appealing to the children. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's just one example of um, the way the adult can change. Mm -hmm. Um, As far as the environment, allowing the children to make decisions within the environment. So say in level one, how if you had a uh, follow-up work that had, say, liturgical pasting, Mm -hmm. you've already got everything on the tray that the child needs in order to be to do the work because at that point the child is not thinking what do I need to do the work the child just needs to be able to do the pasting Mm -hmm. but as the elementary child begins to do some sort of follow-up type work he or she needs to think well what do I need Mm -hmm. hmm I'm gonna need a pair of scissors I'm going to need a piece of poster board, you know, and I'm probably collaborating with a friend or two mm-hmm. in doing this mm-hmm. work. And so, therefore, I'm going to need more space. I'm going to need larger tables mm-hmm. uh, for that big work that uh, the elementary children love. Mm-hmm. Where in level one, they were almost limited to the different extension works that we would present to them. Yes, yes. You could do some free art. You could do this altar collage, mm-hmm. etc. But in level two, their extension work goes as far as their imagination. Right. So oftentimes in level two or three, my end of presentation, how might you continue to think about this? Right. And so for some children, that's if it's a scripture-based uh, presentation, you know, they might want to read it again. Some children might want to copy it again. Some children might want to to draw or make a model or, as you know, the sky's the limit. Right. And then that, the thing that happens in the elementary atria, that herd instinct kicks in. Mm -hmm. And so um, one group working with material in a certain way then will spark 
another idea with another group and right and and you know you have to you have to be open to allowing that as the adult in the room mhm yeah i remember one time after a presentation i had a child it was like he had this whole synthesis happen in his brain. And so he went and pulled out his Vatusha and our room was not big enough for the Vatusha. I don't think anybody's is, but he spiraled that Vatusha all around the room and that herd happened where everybody started helping him. And he started synthesizing the work that we did that day on the Vatusha where he thought, where in the history of the kingdom of God, where in the timeline did this potentially happen? And then he found other works around the room that we had already discussed, and he added it to the timeline as well. I mean, by the end of it, half of the atrium was being used because half the classroom was doing it. And they had made this huge synthesis work. And, you know, I would have never thought to have said to him at the end of the presentation, you can make a synthesis with the Fatusha and all the works that we've discussed this year. I mean, that is not an extension work that I presented, but it's something that his mind came up with and all the children got involved in it. But because it came from him, right. it had so much more meaning. You know, if I had said it, he probably wouldn't have wanted to do it. Where a level one child, I don't think I've ever seen a level one child come up with their own extension work beyond like free art well when you see that beginning to happen that's a clear sign that they are indeed moving into the second plane Mm, transitioning so the different needs and capacities of this child especially in regards to their religious capacities they they change. And so how do we, in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, how do we meet those changing needs and capacities of that second plane child? Again, I think it comes down to just being present mm-hmm. and allowing um, those responses to happen, say, with the parables. Mm-hmm how a child can hear the same parable in level one, level Mm -hmm. two, and level three, and hear it differently Mm -hmm. over the course of nine years. I think um, I mentioned the Pearl of Great Price earlier, but that is just such a good example of how a child's religious capacity and moral capacity changes from that of, um, you know, the kingdom is, is beautiful, is mysterious, it's to be desired to, you know, level two, mm-hmm. the, the pearl merchant um, sold it to have it, but it's, it's all about the pearl merchant, you know, he even, you know, did he sell his house? You know, if they even want to take the environment away sometimes, but it's all about the pearl merchant. But then in level three, they really, you see this inward turning um, and they really are starting to reflect on what does this mean for me? I think there is a danger of trying to get the child there too quickly Mm. to rush the child to that personal response when they need to, you know, Sophia talks to the difference about a difference between the objective moment and the subjective moment um, that, uh, that at first it's um, the parables could be a subjective parable. It's all about the pearl merchant. It's all about Mm -hmm. the, the bridesmaids. But then as they begin to make it about them, about them, their own lives, um, that's, that's kind of a personal work that sometimes we, they may interior, interiorize those responses and we don't even sometimes know about them. Mm-hmm. And again, we have to be okay with that as well. Mm. I would also say we see it in the environment and in the materials at level three in that many of those those themes that had the huge big community work the catechesis great lessons the um, history of the kingdom of god the plan of god Mm -hmm. all of those materials or presentations that come off of that they all at the end come full circle and they come back 
to the child, the history of the kingdom of God and my place in it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like we see all of the work they have done coming to full circle. Mm -hmm. And that is so beautiful when they have the opportunity to do that. And I think what you just said a little bit ago is so important that we cannot rush the child to that moment of applying whatever the presentation is to their own lives. Right. They just need to sit in it for a while, yeah. to be in it for a while. Yeah, to receive it mm-hmm. and then have and have that deep of a response. And I think it's very, maybe we could say the work of the adult, that even though we might be in that place, right. of, like we might be asking ourselves, how does the plan of God apply to me in my life? To not expect that the child that's in front of us to be in that same place that we are. I think that that is a common weakness that we have as adults is to take what we have received from this presentation and assume that the children in front of us, or maybe even the adults that are in front of us should be receiving something similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that definitely takes a lot of internal purging, I think. Um, And I think that from an academic standpoint that we were probably, most of us were probably formed in a way that, um, that every presentation had an objective and, and at the end there's the, you know, all right, let's make sure we got it. You know, Right. Yeah. Did you get what you were supposed <laughs> yes, to get? Yes. Yes. And if not, let's try one more time. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> and so, um, and you know, whether one is a trained um, educator or not, most people were brought up with that particular type of model and so it's and it comes from a good place it comes from a well-meaning place but that's I think we just have to recognize that's part of how we're formed right and to somehow figure out how to purge that Mm -hmm. it's it's similar to how I think in in level one where people want to talk to the children while they're working and they feel sometimes they feel useless because the children are busy working. So, you know, the well-meaning adult will go up and ask the child about his work. And of course, that's, we know better, but. I don't remember exactly what the quote said. And and I believe it was Montessori that said it, that spoke about how we as adults, if we have nothing to do but to just sit in the corner and observe, like in a rocking chair, then we're doing it right. Uh I don't remember what the exact quote is. Obviously, but especially in level one, but even so in the level two and level three atrium, if we can sit back and let the children unfold things themselves, Mm -hmm. then that is the ideal state of the adult. Right. Hmm. So much to ponder with this plain child. But Anna, I want to thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, especially all your experience with this age child, to help us to go a little bit further into how this second plain child also can reveal to us who God is, just as much as that level one child. Yes, yes, absolutely. So thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on the podcast and sharing your wisdom. Thank you for having me. I hope you all enjoyed this episode with Anna Hurdle. Again, I put a link in our show notes for you to get a copy of Life in the Vine, The Joyful Journey Continues. This is the companion book for the second plain child with the religious potential of the child too for the six to 12 year old. It's just like The Good Shepherd and the Child, The Joyful Journey is for the level one child. It's a brand new book that just came out this year by Rebecca Reutzevich. I will put links to different episodes where we talk about the book or different chapters in the book in our show notes. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. We would like to thank all the contributing members for making this podcast possible. If you would like to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd or to become a member, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening this week. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.